Hello, welcome to A Budget for the Common Good. I would like to begin by respect respectfully recognizing and acknowledging that we are gathered here this evening on the unsurrendered and unceded territorial lands of the Wallace, Wallastuck, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. My name is Carol Chan, and I will be the moderator for this evening's event. Thank you so much for tuning in and for sending us your questions. This evening, we are here for a budget for the common good. This is a pre-budget consul consultation with New Brunswick's three green MLAs, David Kuhn, leader of the Green Party and MLA for Fredericton South, Megan Mitten, MLA for Memramcook Tantramar, and Kevin Arsno, MLA for Kent North. As the 2022-23 budget fast approaches, your Green MLAs want to hear from you so they can amplify your voices in the legislature. David will also consider your input as he writes his pre-budget submission to the Minister of Finance later this month. As we are faced with the crises in climate change, healthcare, and housing, as well as the ongoing effects of COVID-19, it is more important than ever for New Brunswickers to be politically engaged and express their priorities. You are doing just that by joining us tonight and asking questions, which I will be passing on to David, Megan, and Kevin, so they can answer as many as possible over the next hour. So please leave your questions in the chat. Thank you. Veuillez noter aussi que ce soir, on va passer le soirée en anglais, mais jeudi soir à 7 heures sur Facebook aussi, on aura un événement entièrement en français où on va continuer la discussion. So now let's hear from the leader of the Green Party, David Kuhn. Thanks, Carol, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased you've been able to join us tonight. The province has been busy, uh, the provincial government's been busy preparing its budget, uh, which takes effect April the 1st for the next year. Uh, the way it's working, of course, is government departments, the regional health authorities like Horizon and Vitalité have all been submitting their particular budgets. And then overlaying that um, are the uh, expenditures and, and changes to revenue measures um, that the government itself wants to see. Uh, built into the budget to reflect their particular priorities as, uh, on top of the sort of regular operating uh, requirements uh, for departments and regional health authorities. So uh, they basically are going to pretty well finalize it within two weeks from now. So uh, this is going to be a great opportunity for us to take the priorities uh, that you're focusing on and you're sharing with us forward both in terms of the submission that uh, that we'll make to the finance minister, but also in terms of when we reply to the budget itself with our speeches and reply to the budget, uh, we can draw on some of the things we heard from you uh, to include that in, in our response to the budget. So it's very much connected uh, to the ground and the grassroots. So um, really, it's, that's it. It's 11. It's about $11 billion is what the the, uh, the budget is roughly every year these days. Um, there was a financial report just came out today from the province which is projecting a $485 million surplus, almost half a billion dollars surplus, when uh, for this year, they were originally projecting a deficit of something like around 30 million, roughly. Um, there's also another 160 some odd million dollars in carbon tax revenue, uh, which uh, is uh, to be allocated as well. So um, there's climate action, there's seniors care, there's health care, there's mental health care, there's affordable housing, there's poverty reduction, um, all kinds of priorities that uh, you might have and uh, we're eager to hear them. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, Megan, if you would like to take the floor. Thanks, Carol. And thank you to everyone who's joined us here tonight. Um, I, I guess I want to start by just acknowledging that it's it's been a, a difficult uh, two years for, for a lot of people with the pandemic. And frankly, there were a lot of problems with a lot of the systems we were dealing with before that. And 
I was thinking uh, there have been sort of jokes on the internet saying like, you know, you receive an email saying, I hope this finds you well. And uh, a lot of people saying this isn't finding me well. And so I just want to acknowledge, I know a lot of people um, have been having a, a hard time. And uh, and I think there's an opportunity with a budget to, for, for government to address some of the reasons that, that people have been having a hard time. A clear one is properly investing in mental health care, but there are other things as well. And, you know, when we look at a budget, uh, we could talk about a, a lot of different things, but um, when you get down to basics, I think they, uh, the budget should at least make sure that people have their basics, basic needs met. And, uh, and that's not happening in our, our province. There are people who are literally struggling to survive in, in different ways. And, and I mean, we've seen some, some really challenging situations. People have, have died um, because they've been unhoused and haven't had the, the care they need. Um, and so uh, this discussion is really about priorities. Budgets are about priorities. And what are the government's priorities? And, and that's what we're going to see in this budget. Is, is it investing in healthcare and investing in training uh, enough healthcare workers? Is it um, investing in things like... Um, making sure that people have a, a livable income is and is it investing in making sure that we have a proper food supply we're, we're looking at you know agriculture and farming and and addressing food security things like that are we are we addressing climate change both looking at energy efficiency but also looking at um looking at um, you know, energy, transportation, there are so many things we could look at, but again, we need to go back to, to the basics. And I guess throughout the budget discussions, we often see governments measuring things in GDP and really focused on growth. Uh, I guess I'd like to see things measured in terms of inequality, in terms of poverty rates, in terms of people's well-being, in, in terms of what our society looks like and how people are actually doing. And, and we often don't see that. We see, we see numbers, we see GDP, we see constant growth, which we all know isn't, can't, can't go on forever. And, um, and so it's about shifting our priorities and and really investing in resilient, livable communities and taking care of people. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you tonight and to, to having this discussion. And then, um, as David said, taking your voices to the legislature. And uh, and yeah, uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Carol. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. And uh, just before I hand it over to Kevin, I just wanted to commend all three of you uh, as a layperson in terms of the work you've been doing um, for translating those numbers into real life actions and meaning for people. I think you've been doing a great job. My own personal opinion, this is not a paid advertisement, but um, keep at it. So on to Kevin. Thanks, Carol, and, and thank you to, uh, to Megan and David for those opening remarks. And, and I guess uh, I'll try not to go over the same things, but, you know, this is tonight, um, we're talking about a budget for common good. And um, so we have seen, you know, 40 years of underfunding. Um, and so um, when we see a lot of problems, uh, this, like, you know, uh, looking at, at, at what kind of effect the pandemic had on our health system, that problem isn't going away. And so that's what we have to uh, realize. It's not um, that this, this pro these problems in our, in our public services are not going away. And so we've been living um, since the McKenna era under uh, neoliberalist, neoliberalist uh, policies, uh, which have cut, 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 and cut. And so um, these ideals of, of common good and these ideals of strong public services and um, this ideal of eliminating poverty um, haven't been taken into effect in the past 40, 40 years plus budgets. So it's time to start uh, putting that back. We, um, during the pandemic, we saw governments calling on citizens, on the people to, uh, to uh, be in solidarity. Uh, th that was a word that was tossed around a lot, solidarity. Now it's time for government to show that solidarity with the people um, in, by, by uh, investing in them, in, in us um, as, as, as people. And so, um, and often 
we hear, uh, well, how do you invest uh, that much into uh, things like climate change and, and eliminating poverty and, and, and social or cooperative housing? Well, there's always a second side on, on, the, on, the, on a budget, and uh, that's the revenue side. And so even if we do have a surplus and, and, and the government um, today was out in the news saying that, well, these are one-time transfers, we, we have to stay safe with it. There's a way of stabilizing these, these revenues. And the different ways that we could stabilize revenues are um, you know, having a concrete plan and, and concrete action against tax havens. So th there's these tax evasion schemes that we've legalized um, government after government in that we've helped people, uh, rich people, uh, if, avoid paying taxes. And so to go after those and, and ensure that everyone is doing their fair share and investing into the common good um, needs to be happening. We also need to be, uh, I think, uh, alluded to it. We need to be, um, you know, really thinking hard about this, this myth of exponential growth that won't ever stop. So into our budgets, we need to start working in also um, degrowth and, and thinking about degrowth and how we're going to deal with that and how our communities are going to stay resilient through that. Um, because if we don't start thinking about degrowth, uh, well, we can't attack the climate crisis. And, um, <clears throat> And so these these false um, we we have to be stay critical on these false solutions that government are offering. Like today, talked about uh, slashing the double tax, which isn't actually a double tax. It's just that people that own their first house have a uh, tax credit, uh, and so it's not a double tax. These these people that have two, three, four, or five. 200 properties are paying full tax. And so um, it, it needs to stay that way. There's uh, other ways also. I'm sure a lot of people have already heard about um, how we need to tax the web giants. Uh, New Brunswick does not have laws on taxing web giants. C certain jurisdictions do. Um, when we think about uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and all those kind of ads, though, that money could be re-put into our local, uh, in, into our local media, uh, independent <laughs> local media. Um, and, and when we think about um, things like Netflix uh, and different services like that that aren't taxed in New Brunswick, this is the kind of money that could be re-put into our arts and culture sector and, and ensure that we have a thriving arts, arts and culture sector that I'll probably touch later in the meeting. But I'm going to stop there for now because I can go on uh, even in my second language for a long time. So I'm going to control myself and, and stop that right now and throw that back to, to Carol. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I really appreciate, appreciate you walking through the revenue side of the ledger. Oftentimes when we have these meetings, we don't, I think, touch on them enough. And, and it seems, as Megan was referring to, that if we're looking at how we want to shape our society, that's definitely part of the equation. So um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, je veux juste uh, faire un petit rappel si uh, des francophones qui se joignent à nous ou les gens qui veulent s'exprimer en français, que ce soir, uh, on va uh, avoir cette discussion en anglais, mais on va continuer cette discussion jeudi à 7 heures le soir sur le Facebook en français aussi. So um, I have the first question here for David from uh, Gilles Cormier. Um, and he asks, what can we do as a province to make sure we have enough people to fill the labor shortage that is increasing day by day because of our aging population? David, you're on mute right now. That happened. Okay, no, I'm not. Uh, there's plenty to be done. And I would start with uh, international students. International students uh, uh, in our universities, all of them uh, are part of our community and over, over the time of the university career, they become part of our community. Many, many want to stay and contribute to our community uh, into the future. And we need to make sure that uh, New Brunswick is uh, supportive of them while they're in school and appealing to them uh, when they graduate to stay. So there is a source, um, as well as, of course, uh, people moving from elsewhere in the country and, uh, and immigrating into New Brunswick. But to do these things, we need to address some very important issues. We need to ensure that government puts in place a meaningful uh, and effective 
program to tackle racism. Because if we're inviting the world to come to New Brunswick, if we're inviting international students to encourage them to stay, um, we've got to come to grips with, with racism. And, uh, and that's a, a key piece here. Uh, other provinces have taken some significant initiatives and uh, there's lots of good examples to draw from in terms of what, uh, what role government can play in that way. Similarly, not similarly, but also um, we have, a, as we know, a big problem with affordable housing in the province. And if we're going to try and increase our population, uh, we need to increase the supply of affordable housing. And there is a direct role that government can play. We have, it has the tools on the books in the form of the New Brunswick Housing Corporation that's mandate in law is to basically support the development of affordable housing. Uh, things like non-market housing, cooperative housing, nonprofit housing, and so on. Uh, but it's, it's been not extinct, but you know, hibernating uh, since the McKenna years. And uh, it needs to be revitalized, be brought back uh, to play a vital role in supporting the development of affordable housing, particularly in the nonprofit and cooperative sector, that non-market housing that doesn't depend on, on a profit motive, um, but uh, provides a shelter and a home to people who need it. Thank you, David. Um, continuing on the line of affordable housing, um, Cecile Casita says that home care in New Brunswick needs to be addressed in affordable care. So affordable care, affordable housing, excuse me, um, and staffing. Government continues to build nursing homes. That's not um, where seniors want to live. Megan, do you mind uh, taking that? And do you need me to repeat it? Because I kind of cut it halfway. <laughs> uh, no, that's OK. And thank you, uh, Cecile, for the question. Um, yes, this is. Uh, a very important issue and it's only going to uh, I guess continue to to become an even bigger issue I would say uh, I've heard from from seniors uh, one of the issues is um, that yeah not everyone wants to be in a nursing home um, and so what are the other options and there are some creative different housing um, <laughs> opportunities that that could be invested in to um, to ensure that there are different options. So um, I've, I know some seniors have said they want to be able to uh, maybe share some different spaces, have, have different accessible options, especially. Um, but the other thing would be uh, being able to age in place. And, um, and so again, being able to make sure, I'd say as, as housing is built in the future, we should make it more accessible for everyone, but being able to make those accommodations, uh, upgrade anything that you need, but then having um, access to home care workers, for example. We, we have issues with staffing in terms of like in hospitals, in nursing homes, also for home care. I know that when my dad was sick and, and he moved into my home, and so that was, uh, that's what that's what we did, but I had so much trouble finding uh, home care uh, workers to to be able to help out. So I think that's really important. The other thing is um, that we're seeing more and more, and this isn't new, um, but it, it's getting a lot worse. Is that seniors are having trouble affording um, staying in their place? So we also need to make sure that the different housing options that exist include affordable housing, include making sure that the rent can't spike and that seniors aren't being kicked out of their homes. And so I, I think that as with a lot of these issues, there's not one silver bullet. We need to have different options for, uh, for different people. And, and so I, I think that uh, making sure that the proper care, uh, you know, infrastructure that will look different for different people, but then also addressing the poverty aspect of it, that people have, have what they need to, to live in dignity um, and, and to not lose their housing. Thank you, Megan. Our next question is another question for David. Um, Bethany Young says that COVID has put a lot of strain on many sectors. The one that concerns her the most is uh, the social development sector. Frontline social workers trying to support the most vulnerable children in our communities are receiving more requests than ever. The amount of turnover is extreme and the lack of support for foster families is dire. She says she is concerned for the well-being of these young people. Would you comment on that, David? 
Yeah, I would say when we have a surplus of $485 million to work with in the province, that uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that the Departments of Social Development should be able to, to draw on to, um, to provide the resources they need to address the significant issues that have developed in the wake, well, not the wake, but in the course of, uh, of the pandemic here. Um, there's been a lot of, lot of impacts uh, that demand serious attention and, and real assistance, and that costs money. Uh, there's $485 million surplus uh, for next year. These are the kinds of priorities that, uh, that it should be uh, spent on uh, so that it supports people and helps people uh, recover and address uh, the, the real um, challenges that, that face us uh, coming, through, uh, coming through COVID and hopefully out the other end in the near future. Thank you, David. I think uh, Kevin might have something to add to that uh, response from David. Well, actually, I wanted to add a bit on on the on the uh, labor shortage, uh, because something I see often in in my riding and, and elsewhere in the province is also in, in talking about living in dignity and everything. And, um, you know, uh, we, we need to ensure that there is well paid and livable wages. And um, we, we see right now that there's a shortage. I, I've been seeing it in my riding and I'm sure you guys are seeing it all across the province. There is a labor shortage in bus drivers and, and many, sco many schools are asking uh, district school districts are asking parents to drive their kids to and from school uh, morning and night. And this is uh, the, the situation in many communities uh, in, in my riding. So, and, but they're still without a contract since, since uh, the QP uh, general strike, the only, um, the only people that hadn't signed a contract were the, the bus drivers. So uh, ensuring well-paid livable wages. And, and um, I think that we need to be also, um, you know, having the reflection as a society on, on ensuring that there's uh, proper wealth sharing, um, you know, capping wages, um, uh, uh, capping wage gaps uh, is what, what, what I mean, uh, between the highest earner and the lowest earner of, of, of companies. And, and some jurisdictions are moving into that direction um, in ensuring that there's pay equity. We still don't have pay equity in New Brunswick in, 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 in the private and, and I'd say the, 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 the public sector. And so there, there's uh, addressing these kind of issues and making sure that, that people, um, I, I think everyone wants to work a meaningful job. And so sometimes when you don't feel that you're, um, that you're, 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 you're being treated in a meaningful and dignified way, um, some, some of these uh, job shortages um, definitely uh, would um, would not completely disappear, but part of it. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, I think Megan has something to add here. Yeah, one of the the themes I'd say so far is we're talk talking about labor issues, and I wanted to add. Um, Kevin addressed pay equity, which was something I wanted to address. So you know, yeah, being being paid fairly and um, and the, the other thing is, and is that child care, affordable child care, uh, is a really big issue for a lot of people. And it's a, a barrier to being able to be in the workforce. And there are studies and real life uh, case studies that show that when there's affordable child care, that especially women's engagement in the workforce increases. Um, and and so I, I this this is essential that that there's very accessible, very affordable. Um, ideally, we'd have universal child care and we'd have universally funded education and universally funded post-secondary education. That's, I, that's where we need to go. So we're covering people's education and child care. And, and so at the other end, so we need child care. We also need training and we, we need New Brunswick students to not be going into severe debt among the highest in the country in order to you know, um, become a nurse, for example. Uh, we need proper funding for, for things like nursing seats, but we need access to all kinds of different training in, in the, the um, 
in the, to be able to be in the, the labor force and, and work in these uh, jobs that, that we're, we're talking about. So I guess I, I would say, I just wanted to add those things um, in terms of you know, education and, and that there's a gendered element to, to uh, some of this. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for raising the issue of uh, gender equity. Uh, both you and Kevin. Um, I, I do believe in looking at the last year's budget that um, the, the government generally uh, has started using gender-based analysis um, to start, but uh, it, it is at least a lens and maybe somewhere to actually hold people to task because they've committed to it. Um, and I'd be interested to, to hear, not tonight, but um, in the future, what what um, advances have been made based on what was promised in that lens and uh, whether that lens actually makes sense. Um, uh, one example was tourism dollars being um, allotted to a sector that is primarily um, serviced by women, uh, but I'm not sure how much that actually impacts us as as a group. So. Um, I'll leave that for another day. Um, I believe we have another question from Gilles Caumier for Kevin this time. Um, how can we work with municipalities to fix the affordable housing issue, not only in urban areas, but rural areas as well? Absolutely, and it needs to go back uh, to a community-based, uh, I mean, municipalities, local communities know the needs and and know what um, the problem is and if if we leave it up like like the conservatives would love to do it say the free market will take care of it uh which is completely bogus um we're going to see a lot of development in the city areas uh because that's where the return on investment is probably going to be higher and so if you leave it to that uh, you're not going to be uh, addressing the needs of of, uh, of New Brunswickers and, and citizens all across the province. So how do you do that? I think you need to be giving more resources. Um, so sharing sharing the, the, the provincial pot and 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 asking uh, municipalities to um, to to be able to uh, to assess those needs and develop models that uh, that help those needs. So is it part uh, social housing? Is it uh, part, uh, you know, encouraging cooperatives, uh, encouraging different uh, planning uh, in, in, into municipalities? And, and all by continuing uh, to go forward with the whole ideal of equal chances uh, put in place uh, by, uh, by Robichaud, the Robichaud government um, in making sure that there's equitable transfer so that there's not uh, some regions in the province which are being completely left out because they're seeing maybe degrowth in population or whatsoever, but the need is still there. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that definitely can't happen uh, is cutting cutting the double tax like uh, the Higgs government wants to do. Um, this, is, this is not going to help affordable housing. This is not going to help housing development. This is only going to help uh, accumulation of more private property. Landlords are not there to offer housing. They're there to invest into uh, private property. And so um, this needs to be a community-based solution. And I think that the municipal community level is uh, the best level uh, to look and understand and find uh, creative solutions to this problem. Thank you, Kevin. Um, on to David again. Uh, Don Mockler asks if there are any plans for more education in our healthcare system. Prevention and education will take pressure off hospitals. I would say Sadly, no, right now. In fact, I we were at public accounts committee today and I was asking that very sort of theme question to uh, New Brunswick Health Council representative uh, Stefan Robichaud. So um, this is a role for public health. It's part of its mandate um, to be the lead on that uh, to draw in other parts of the health system. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think two things happened. One is it, uh, it was kind of decapitated uh, when the former Liberal government chopped it into pieces and sent parts of different branches of public health off to other departments. So it really reduced the capacity of public health. 
uh, to do that kind of uh, advocacy and that kind of education and awareness building. And I'll give you a really simple example. Um, they were uh, they were producing uh, materials that were quite good around different um, health prevention, health promotion uh, agendas. And uh, that all stopped uh, some years ago when, when they got chopped up and, 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 and distributed around the, the government. Uh, so that is, that is a problem, that's for sure. Uh, so the capacity issue. Um, and, then you, and then you have to ask, okay, who, who's, who's looking at that now then? And the answer really is public health hasn't got the ability as it's currently construed to do that. And we need, we need that roll back. Whether it's um, I mean, another example would be looking at uh, looking at uh, uh, young families, new families with uh, with babies. You know the the kind of health promotion and preventative measures that could be applied right from the get go uh, are difficult to do anymore because not everyone gets a visit anymore from uh, from public health nurses at the birth of a baby. Um, few people do, in fact. And uh, we thought we were making progress with the uh, first clinic of midwives who do wonderful postnatal care, um, but government and the health authorities have decided not to roll the, the midwifery clinic model out beyond the single clinic that exists in Fredericton. So uh, there really needs to be um, someone in government who's got that mandate and I don't see it and I don't see it even though the rhetoric is there, rhetoric is there, I don't see it as a priority. It was one of the items that was supposed to be addressed in the healthcare reform, and they failed to. Uh, Megan, would you like to add to that? Yeah, um, yeah. I think David did a good job of addressing that, and I appreciate that he mentioned midwifery and perinatal health. And the province, I think, drops the ball on on that. And, in, and a lot of the, the preventative things that we need. And um, I, I want to just um, also look at this through the frame of the social determinants of health. So that basically means, um, you know, what, what contributes to our health. And some of the key things are some of those basics that government isn't ensuring that people have, but like making sure that people aren't living in poverty, making sure that people, um, have housing, having a housing first approach, making sure that people have access to uh, food um, and not just food, but like healthy food, local food, food that meets their, their different needs, whether those are cultural or otherwise, addressing mental health, all of these things contribute to health. And so I, I don't, people's lives are valuable without attaching dollars and cents to it, obviously, but um, from a budgetary perspective, it also makes sense to to address people's health before um, before they have to be in a hospital. If, if they need a hospital, it should be there. But um, but definitely addressing um, preventative health is, is so important. And and uh, governments are so short sighted when it comes to this and many other things. Thank you, Megan. Um, over to Kevin, uh, Jane Duhl says that the minimum wage and social assistance are way too low. The surplus should be used to, address, to help address this. So much of this points to the need for basic universal, sorry, universal basic income. Perhaps you could uh, elaborate on that thought, Kevin. Yes, and, and ab ab absolutely. I mean, um, wage increases need to be happening. Uh, we've been calling for it for a long time. Government could could uh, could could slap its its uh, its tibretel if if it wants to about the thirteen dollar minimum wage increase, but that's still not a livable wage. It's it's in New Brunswick. It's still not uh, a dignifying uh, wage. So um, this this needs to be addressed. Um, fair negotiation. We've seen them negotiate, and and they're not they're not negotiating, um, you know, with uh, with good intentions. So, um, and and when we think about social development, I mean, um, uh, rates uh, they are completely, and and I, I see it day in and day out at, at my constituency office, and and um, eliminating poverty needs to be 
uh, a major focus um, in in today's society. Um, but you can't eliminate poverty without also looking at different factors and investing uh, substantially, like uh, Megan uh, alluded to, and David also into uh, mental health, uh, into uh, addiction services. And so I, I we, we we see that in, in food security. These are all uh, things that need to um, to to be part of this, this rethinking of the economic paradigm that, that we live in. And, and it goes back to what I was saying uh, into uh, capping wage gaps, uh, fighting tax evasion. The, the tax evasion and, and these different wealth inequalities are the reasons that we cannot, uh, that governments cannot uh, act upon these things. So these are, these are choices, violent choices, that, that governments are making um, in not addressing these issues because um, they prefer uh, permitting uh, a few uh, to continue to get away with, uh, with um, you know, robbing us of, of good public services and, and dignified life for all. And so um, universal basic income is, is, is part of that solution. Um, but it, it's a it's a broader it's a broader uh, picture, and you need to be looking at at the different things. But yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's a surplus needs to uh, go to help the people, and not uh, not to cut a double tax to help um, some people accumulate uh, more property. Because by accumulating more property, they're continuing to depossess others. Thank you, Kevin. Um, on a similar topic regarding social assistance, uh, Caitlin Layden wants to know if the budget might address the household income policy. Megan? Thanks for the question, Caitlin. It would be great if, if it did. It would be great if it did, but I, I'm not sure we're going to see that. And the so the household income policy, I know Caitlin knows this, but the household income policy essentially um, takes away uh, income that you may be receiving like social assistance or, or benefits if you have a disability. Um, if, if you, um, for example, uh, get married and move in with your partner, the um, government can say, oh, you're, you're not going to receive your income anymore. And there are a lot of different ways that this impacts people. Uh, and I've seen many constituents uh, up against this. Uh, one of the ways it impacts people is um, if they have a disability and they want to get married, move in with their partner. And, and so it's um, part, of, part of what happens with these government policies is that um, they, in this case, it's discriminating against people with disabilities. And there's a gendered element from from what I've seen is that it disproportionately impacts women with disabilities. And, and so this is the type of policy that we shouldn't have. And what is, um, and, and I guess I wanna address this in, in two ways. One is that what we're talking about is, is people, um, people's income and, uh, and them having their income taken away or having their, their rights limited. And, and again, we need to make sure that people um, are able to live in dignity are, and, and are respected and that their rights are, are not infringed upon. And, and unfortunately, this, that's what's happening. But the other thing that I have learned about since being elected that just frustrates me and is unacceptable is the way that social development and it ends up going after people who are basically living in, in poverty. If, if social assistance rates are, are poverty rates, um, it, it's, there, or it's, the, it's a, an income that, that is under the, the poverty line. And they, they go after people and they'll even cut that off and they'll just claw it back, whatever they can. And I don't, it's not about the social workers. I think the social workers really work really hard with not enough resources in a, in a bad system. But it's it's so disrespectful and terrible. But then to point to what Kevin's saying, there are billionaires <laughs> who just do whatever they want basically and, and extract from our society and extract from our province. Um, and government doesn't, doesn't just lets them do whatever they want. And in fact, helps to write laws that support them and help them to just get richer and richer. Um, and 
And it's just completely unacceptable. It's completely backwards. And again, this is about choices and priorities. And so I would like to see the household income policy changed. I would like to see the social assistance um, and disability benefits um, system overhauled. And I know that there are people um, there, there, there are people who have been advocating for for that, um, like Caitlin, like others, and and keep up the fight. We will continue to advocate for that as well. But this is again going back to human dignity and about human rights. And and I I, I feel like governments are not living up to their their duty to respect people's human rights. Thank you, Megan. Um, next is for David. Um, Jane Duell says that coherent public health policy is very much needed. She says that the one size fits all uh, in healthcare doesn't work, or, or one size doesn't fit all and um, pre preventative health care needs more support, which I think echoes something that was said earlier. Uh, David, do you want to uh, say a few words on that now? Yeah, we, I mean, we have the um, uh, structure in a way to, to ensure that we, no one gets trapped into the one size fits all mentality because we have regional um, um, public health organized on a regional basis with, with medical officers of health so physicians with specialties in public health uh, situated each, in each of the regions of the province. Um, where, 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 where I see the thing falling apart is they actually don't have any st staff to speak of in the region, uh, in the region they're in. So whether it's Charlotte County or, or uh, the, the Acadian Peninsula, they have to rely on the public health staff that are employed by Vitalité or Horizon uh, to, to deliver services. And so the kind of work of developing locally tailored programs um, is more difficult because of that, that division. Uh, so, so because they don't really have staff in the regions, they, they end, to be, end up kind of being more oriented towards the center in Fredericton and that's where the other public health people are. So, so naturally that's where a lot of their conversation and program development occurs. So, so that could be uh, fixed in, in a reasonable restructuring of, of healthcare. Um, to uh, recognize the, the uh, essential uh, role that public health um, plays on a regional basis and, and really tap into its full potential, which we're not. Thank you, David. Um, we're going to be jumping back to, I guess, municipal affairs. Um, Brad Cross says it might be helpful to ensure the newly established municipalities have enough funding and support to be used at the local level in order to take on expanded, expanded activities in the context of municipal reform. Can Kevin speak to uh, the new municipalities, um, what they need to succeed? Definitely. Well, first of all, <clears throat> the province uh something that you know provincial uh, our federal politicians um don't like doing is is handing over uh power uh with with the resources so they need uh, they need uh we need more local community centered uh um power i guess uh, there's probably a better word for it in english but I, i'm just not thinking of it right now um but they also need resources and, and again, I, I bring us back to equal opportunities. And so we need to keep that in mind and, and make sure that, um, that, that uh, there is a, a redistribution across the province to make sure that, um, that there is um, you know, a good um, transfer of, of, these, uh, of these resources but making sure that uh, communities do have the resources to do that. And I'd add to that, that, you know, on the local level, um, we need to be uh, thinking about and being very uh, conscious about um, the way that uh, we organize our, our local democracy. So we need deep democracy. We need, you know, the people that are implicated and the people that are, are going to be um, that, that, subir um, les conséquences de certaines politiques. Um, I, I, I can't think of the, the word in English, but the people that are going to be affected uh, by these policies be implicated in, in the drafting, in the thinking of. And, and so um, there needs to be uh, this kind of uh, major 
um, thought process and 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 time to uh, develop these these models of deep democracy, and <clears throat> it's not just um, in 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 housing or are are different, uh, but also in, in transportation it goes back to the question about how a surplus could be used to um, to eliminate poverty. Um, you know, we we often talk about universal basic income. But there's also a lot of uh, of, of uh, gratu gratuity, and um, so stuff being free, like public transportation, having a better public transportation service in New Brunswick it would help a lot um, uh, in 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 attacking uh, these problems. Um, having public spaces, so organizing our cities around public spaces where you could go be with fellow citizens without having to spend money. Um, so organizing our cities as as these livable spaces, um, and and then also we uh, when I think about gratuity, and uh, I know Megan talked about it, but I but I right away start thinking of my uh, my years as a student leader, and and think about education. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting far from the question of municipal reform, but but it does it does um, uh, impact. Uh, in, in, in these different kind of ways. So, so thinking about um, transportation, public spaces, um, thinking geographically also in our cities, having, uh, you know, attacking climate change uh, and making sure that government is, is uh, in letting go of the resources. And that's, I guess, the main part of my message is that it can't always come with uh, this ideal that um that that daddy government because we all know it's a patriarchal government um knows better and so we need to start having confidence and 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 trusting and and empowering local communities that know the needs of the citizens a lot more and organizing that uh, through uh, deep and meaningful democracy thanks kevin and i think megan wants to add her two cents Thanks. Yeah, to to just add to that, I feel like I need to address there there have been some things in in the writing of Memorial Cook Tantramire that that are, are related to this. And you know, we're seeing some challenges around the the new entity 40 proposal and that it, and, it, and what what ultimately a lot of this is coming down to, and, and this also, I, I think, relates to when we look at healthcare and decisions around the rural hospitals, it's about this local decision making, local power and local resources. And it's going back to really what Kevin is talking about, that the people that are living this, that live here, that understand what the community needs, need to have power, need to be listened to and have autonomy to be able to make those decisions and decide where resources go because we know what we need in different places and it's not gonna be the same everywhere. And so I think this is coming up with municipal reform. It's come up with healthcare in terms of equity, rural versus urban or, or what services are needed where. It ultimately needs to be that we have, yeah, this deeper democracy, this local decision-making and empowering people empowering citizens and I don't mean citizens just status wise citizen people engaging uh, in in our communities and so I wanted to to just add that. Thank you so much Megan. Um, for David now Joan McFarland wants to know if you can ask the government to put caps on the rate that seniors pay at special care and memory care homes as it is now the homes can charge whatever they want. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, only recently governments have started to pay attention to special care homes, both in terms of um, uh, the opportunities they provide for, for care um, and to be part of the solution for, for uh, providing uh, caring care for seniors, but, uh, but also it's raised the issue of costs. And, uh, and I, I know by talking to people in the system that that we've seen seniors stuck in hospital uh, rooms who are looking to move to a special care home but can't afford uh, the extra costs that would be involved for some of those homes in their community, particularly. St. John is a specific example I know of. And so that's got to be addressed. And that means, um, and, and this is not a, a reflection on the special care homes themselves, but rather on the funding formula or lack of a, a fair funding formula to ensure um, that 
seniors and others who need special care home um, uh, services can access them affordably. And uh, we need, so that's a piece of work, absolutely, that we need to uh, uh, place some emphasis on uh, in the Legislative Assembly. Thank you, Joan, for that. Thank you, David. And now for Kevin, uh, <laughs> Deborah Baxter says that we need a greater focus on enlarging unionization. How can we increase unionized jobs? Absolutely, and and, and that's a, a great comment. Um, there's there's uh, concrete ways of of doing that. Uh, I had brought forward uh, with with the caucus uh, anti scab. Uh, bill, um, which needs to pass in New Brunswick. Um, there also needs to be um, some some uh, major changes made to uh, the labor labor law and labor standards. Um, and and uh, I remember this 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 uh, on Twitter. Uh, it had got a lot of traction when uh, when government was applauding. Um, the arrival of a Walmart in the uh, Walmart, uh, an entrepôt, uh, big uh, factory outlet warehouse. Exactly. Thanks. Uh, in the Moncton region, and and instead of applauding them, I I, uh, I think we should uh, welcome them with uh, with strong labor laws. We know that Walmart is a company that um, has been. Uh, very historically uh, anti-union, and and so uh, ensuring that our labor laws in New Brunswick, and I'm, I'm, I I don't think these companies come to New Brunswick because of our nice beaches and and our uh, our, our well-known hospitality. I think they come here because we have uh, lax uh, labor laws, and um, we've had governments that instead of encouraging <clears throat> unionization, has been fighting. Uh, unionization and has been fighting unions and so just in the way and, and I could understand that in, in the end of the day uh, in some cases government is an employer and must negotiate with unions but there's a way of negotiation uh, of negotiating all while respecting everyone's right to uh, unionization and not fighting it as if it was some kind of a problem and and so just the shift and how we treat unions in New Brunswick could uh, help, uh, I think, uh, the greater picture and, and, and be encouraging uh, everyone um, to get, uh, get either uh, unionized, our, our forming uh, worker, worker cooperatives, our, our different forms of, uh, of more equitable um, and, and defense uh, and, uh, and collective bargaining. And I'll just add that to reiterate that, that there needs to be supportive legislation to make that easier so that people in sectors that are, haven't been traditionally unionized can more easily unionize. We know the evidence is, is solid about what that means for benefits and wages, so, so important. Um, so we, we played a little role as Greens in, in helping to get uh, first contract legislation in place. Um, so that, that, that's, that's an example of supportive legislation um, which ensures that uh, uh, there's a fair process for uh, places that unionize for the first time to, to establish their, their, their initial first contract. Um, but there's much more that needs to be, do, be done legislatively. And that, after all, is the work of, of parliamentarians, of MLAs. And so uh, uh, it's, yeah, it, it'll be great work. Thanks for, for uh, the suggestion. Thank you, Deborah and David and Kevin for your responses. So Ben Manette asks how we can use our surplus to help address the link between affordable housing supply, poverty and low wages and drug crime. And I believe this is for Megan. Uh, thanks for the question, Ben. Uh, I, I think that this is the type of thinking that I'd like to see in government. I'm worried we won't see see um, this investment in in um, basically what I think would be investing in people, investing in our communities, investing in services that people need. And I think uh, how well I know a housing approach, uh, or sorry, a housing first approach is needed. So making sure that people have um, 
have housing and then the services that they need to uh, support them. And, and then ad addressing, we've talked about, you know, having a basic livable income or universal basic income. There's lots of different ways to say it, but essentially making sure people have a, a steady income um, and that their, their needs are met. And, and then uh, th this is sort of, that's like individual level things. We need, you know, harm reduction supports. We need um, investing in housing and, and there's the, we need to address like rent caps. We need to make sure people are not getting rent evicted and kicked out of their housing and all these things that are happening right now. But government has also really dropped the ball on their, on the public housing. NB housing, they sometimes divest themselves of housing that exists because they've let it go into disrepair and they don't take care of it anymore, or there's mold or whatever in the housing that stock they have, they don't have enough, the wait list has thousands of people on it. So investing in public housing and, um, and looking at different ways, um, you know, there was a question from Cecile earlier about seniors housing, but looking at different housing supports, because re really it's, it's about taking care of people. And so I'm talking about the care side, about supporting people, but also the approach. We don't need a war on drugs. I, I know that you know Higgs Fleming government is is really in that antiquated mindset um, of of just tough on crime and we're gonna do this. And and I've seen ads even on social media where government's saying like, call up on your neighbor if you think this, this, this. There are serious issues in our communities, but this war on crime mentality, instead of a harm reduction, investing in people, investing in communities, like that's the way to go, not, not investing. You know, there's, a, there's been a lot of talk and I know it's fallen off in the past year, but when, you know, the protests um, after George Floyd was murdered and Black Lives Matter and defunding the police and discussions around that, that the, those issues haven't gone away. And we need to look at what keeps our community safe and what takes care of people. And that's what we need to be investing in. And that's what governments keep underfunding and not investing in. So we need to change that. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I have one more question from Deborah Baxter. Uh, which, and we're getting close to the end. So um, this one will go to David. Um, Deborah asks, how, we, how do we promote and incentivize the transition to a do circular or donut economy? David, uh, you need to get off mute so that we can hear you. Thank you. Um, you gotta vote green, <laughs> really. Um, because, because that reflects a particular worldview that's consistent with, with, the, with the values and principles uh, of, of Greens and green, Greens in politics. Um, it's inconsistent with those of the conventional traditional parties like the Conservatives and the Liberals here in New Brunswick. So, so really, in, in, in this, in this, this is a good example. It matters how you vote, and in something like as fundamental like that, which re reflect re requires a sort of paradigm shift in the way we look at the economy and the kinds of programs and legislation and 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 fiscal measures, incentives, and so on that are in place, taxation. Uh, you've got to come at it with that worldview, and it's not something that is going to emerge out of the traditional parties. I can guarantee you. So uh, uh, I don't want this to sound pad or simplistic, but it does matter who you vote for. And if you're looking for uh, us to move to an economy like that, then you've got to vote for a party who embraces that kind of an economy, who's committed to helping to build that kind of a economy. And, and, and those are the Greens. Thanks so much, David. And um, one last question for all of you um, is about public transportation with viewers saying that we are far too dependent on individual vehicles. Some uh, people can't drive or afford a vehicle. What is being done on public transportation, including in rural areas? So I'll start with Kevin on this, please. Sure, absolutely. And, and, and we are far too dependent on, on personal vehicles. And, uh, and I mean, Electric cars are are maybe part of the solution, but they aren't the solution for sure. And and um, so public transportation is going to be uh, playing an increasing role. Um, I I've done the exercise of of, of trying. Uh, um, well, definitely been thinking about doing the exercise of trying to get to Fredericton with public transportation.
presentation and that that is completely uh, very very hard and uh, hopefully i'll have something for you guys uh, coming sometime soon on that um, but I all we also tried the experience of trying to um, create a, a cooperative um, to have access to uh, a vehicle collectively, and and the way that the laws are written, um, the the co-op act needs to be uh, once again reworked. It was reworked, and there was some good changes in it. I think in two thousand eighteen or two thousand nineteen, and uh, the Greens had had pushed for some stuff on that. Uh, but it, it's, it has to go further. And, and uh, I remember us looking at that model and saying, you know, it could be very interesting as a rural area to have, uh, you know, a collective car uh, that could be used between many families. And, and to ensure that makes it completely impossible. I think for, for six households, we were talking about $18,000 a year of insurance. So it, it, it just, it takes away the, the possibility to do it. So we need to definitely break those barriers. And, and that happens with legislation, that happens with the work here as parliamentarians in, in the legislature. But there's much more to add on that, and, but I'll let my colleagues continue because I'm sure they'll have very good perspectives on that. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll go to Megan and then wrap up with David on this question, if possible. Uh, thanks, Carol. Yeah, the, transportation is um, a major challenge, especially when you live in a rural area, as as um, we see in in a lot of New Brunswick. A lot of New Brunswick is rural, uh, but but I know it's it's a problem in urban areas as well, as well where there's not adequate um, public transportation especially, um, and accessible transportation is an issue. Um, and what we really need is, is leadership and investment in these things. And we, you know, we've, we've mentioned a lot of different areas where government is failing to show leadership, is failing to make investments. And this is another one. We really need public transportation. And one of the reasons we need it is for healthcare. Access to healthcare is, is a major barrier. And I, I want to acknowledge that there are people who've been trying hard to put together um, some solutions to that. You know, there's rural rides, there are some different solutions, but we, we need to think bigger on a lot of things. And we need to think bigger on transportation and on public transportation and stop seeing things as the individual problem. Look at the collective, look at what the society needs, look at what the system looks like, the infrastructure that's needed for our communities and not what's that person need, that person need, that person need. Because we just can't keep, um, well, for one thing, it isn't even fair the way it is now, but we also, we can't keep treating it, um, it that way. We can't, yeah, have every single person have an electric car. It's just not the way it goes in terms of, you know, starting to think of um, this degrowth or, or just not having uh, infinite uh, resources. So I, I just to add to that, I've been talking to the other Green, the Green Party leaders in, in the Maritimes in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia about this, about the, uh, and this is something we've discussed in our caucus, about approaching public transportation on a regional basis to, to, to really kind of get the economies of scale working there, to look at um, uh, acquiring, uh, having the governments through a Crown Corporation acquire uh, Maritime Bus, for example, to provide bus service through the three provinces in a way that really meets people's needs as a public service, um, to acquire the rails in, in, in the Maritimes. Um, sorry, PEI, I know you lost yours, but to uh, New Brunswick and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, to acquire the rails and, uh, and put, put in place uh, in cooperation with a deal with Ottawa and VIA regional rail service uh, that would meet local needs for transportation. Uh, so you can imagine uh, a nice seamless system of rails, uh, motor coaches, city transit buses, um, and uh, and 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 at, at those hubs or, or 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 bus stations and so on. Imagine a a hub where you have a, the bus stops, you have a, a, an electric car share uh, operation, so that you can pick up a car there if you needed a car. You've got uh, bike rentals. Um, you've got that whole sort of public transportation hub um, and then distributed across the region, which uh, would provide you access to, 
to whatever way you need uh, that's going to suit you best to get around uh, without having to rely on a private vehicle. And I think that would, in a sense, revolutionize um, our region and put us uh, really put us put us out in front when it comes to uh, grappling with the need for for accessible and affordable transportation that that is, is going to also contribute to dramatically cutting our carbon footprint. Thanks so much, David. And uh, that's a wrap for our questions tonight. Um, I would like to thank David, Megan, and Kevin for joining us tonight, but especially everyone who signed in on Facebook. Um, uh, Kevin mentioned deep democracy earlier, and I think that's exactly what you're displaying by, by joining us in this conversation. Um, please spread that seed of deep democracy so that we can keep this momentum going. If you want to stay up to date with uh, what Kevin, Megan and David are up to, give them a like on Facebook, Instagram, or follow them on Twitter. Um, and uh, if you do want to participate in this continued conversation in French, please join us on Thursday night, jeudi soir, ça serait une discussion en français à cette heure le soir. Thank you and have a good night.